Hello everyone. Today we're going to use Dask Data Frame on a cluster to read CSV data from HDFS. We're going to connect to our local scheduler. This is, this is a scheduler running on the head node and connecting out to eight worker machines also on the cluster. Each of these worker machines has, is running eight processes. So we've got 64 workers and 64 total threads. We're going to load data from the New York City Taxicab data set. Let's start that going now. We're loading this data from HDFS. So this is, the, this is every ride, every taxi cab ride from the yellow cabs in the city of New York City for the years of 2014 and 2015. We're reading it using this HDFS module from the distributed library, which has a read CSV function that matches the pandas API almost exactly. In fact, it's using the pandas read CSV function under the hood, and we're just passing these keyword arguments through. In particular, our two data sets have date time columns, so we're using the parse date functionality. And the 2014 data set has some odd columns with spaces in them, and so we're adding skip initial space equals true. It's worth noting that we're leveraging pandas significantly for all of this work. Uh, in particular, what's sort of pleasant, so the object we're getting back here is a, is a Dask data frame, which looks exactly like a pandas data frame, except it manages larger data sets, uh, coordinating many pandas data frames under the hood. Um, so all of the sort of computations here that are familiar to Pandas users are also present on Dask data frames, or at least a subset of them. Uh, we saw in this progress bar, so it looks like our data set has finally finished loading. Um, and now we can actually look at our data set um, and perform computations on it cheaply. So let's look at the head of each of the data sets. So here we're seeing the first five rides for every year uh, of both years. Uh, and just some sort of some nice columns in there. We're seeing things like pick up and drop off date times, how many passengers were in there, uh, as well as you know things about uh, various tips and fares. Interestingly, it looks like the columns differ a little bit year by year, and also looks like there was a, a bad row here in the CSV file, or maybe just an errant end line. Uh, fortunately, because we're using pandas under the hood, uh, all the various small cases like this have been taken care of by the many years and work of the pandas developers. So we're just building on top of that. Um, so let's go and look at uh, how many rides there were in each year. And interestingly, it looks like there were fewer rides in 2015. It looks like the cab industry slightly contracted. Uh, let's, let's verify that and look at the uh, passenger count. And so if you're familiar with the Pandas API, this should look familiar. I'm pulling out the passenger count column, I'm computing the sum. Uh, the one difference is that when I want a result, I have to add compute. So that's actually going to go out to the cluster and compute that result for me. Let's do the same thing for 2015. Uh, so yeah, it looks like, again, it looks like there were fewer rides in 2015 than there were in 2014. That's interesting. Okay, so uh, it's worth noting that these computations are running uh, at sort of human interactive timescales. So we compute the sum of a column in around 600 milliseconds, compute the length of all of the data frames in around 280 milliseconds, and this isn't, this isn't pre-stored. This is actually going out to the cluster and looking at all of the small pandas data frames that comprise a larger DAS data frame, asking all of those small pandas data frames what their lengths are, and then building that up. So I should note that one DAS data frame is comprised of, this one is comprised of around, I think, 170 pandas data frames scattered in memory on the various nodes of our cluster. And it's the job of the DAS data frame, these objects we're playing with here, to take our input and translate that into some sort of plan to compute the result we want using all of the small uh, sub-results. So I wanted to look at um, the tip amount. So whenever I go to a new city, I always like to see sort of what standard tipping practice is there. And this is a nice way to do it, place to do that because we have the total amount of every computation, as w of every taxi ride, as well as the fare, the mandatory amount, various taxes and fees, and the optional tip. So let's pull out from the 2015 data set uh, just a few columns. Let's just grab the first 10 rows. And so we can see here, it looks like, if we look at the first two rows here, the general estimate of 15 to 20 percent seems about valid. Uh, interestingly, there are a number of rows in which there was zero tip recorded. Uh, I noticed that these happen to correlate very strongly with uh, this payment type of two. I'm actually un unsure of what these payment types mean, uh, but you know, presumably this is you know, credit and cash or something. So again, just to show off the similarity between the DAS data frame API and the Pandas API, let's go and grab the payment type column and let's compute the value counts. 
So this is computing the, the frequency of every com of every event. And again, that's that's happening in human interactive times. Um, and so it looks like one and two are dominant. You know, maybe this is credit and cash. Um, and let's go and look at, let's filter out all of the events in which the uh, tip amount was zero. Takes a little bit longer, but here we see that, oh, so this is flipped quite a bit. It looks like almost all events in which there was no tip happened to coincide with a tip uh, fraction of zero, uh, with a payment type of, of two. Um, and actually it looks like almost all events of this type, there's only a couple thousand that don't fall into this category. So if this is cash, it means there's only a couple thousand rides in which there was a tip recorded for this payment type. So that's interesting. Okay, so um, I want to take this data set and I want to filter out uh, these sort of weird rows and I want to give it the tip fraction. So I wanted to divide by the tip amount. I want to divide the tip amount by the fair amount, call that the tip fraction. And then we're going to group that column by day of week and by hour and see if there's any trends throughout the day. See if it's better to ride a taxi or to be a taxi driver at some point in the day. Before we do that, I want to filter out uh, these sort of weird payment types that always tend to be zero because they might screw with our results. And I also want to uh, filter out any occasion in which the fare happens to be zero. And this, is, this happens surprisingly often. So if you look at the fare amount, oh, uh, if I look at the 2015 data, look at the fare amount and see where it's zero, we see that there are roughly 44,000 such events. So there are surprisingly many free cab rides in New York City. I, I was never aware of this. Um, so we're going to create this new data frame, which filters out these bad rows, and then adds this new column. And that data frame object is just a Dask data frame. We haven't done any computation yet. That'll happen later when we ask the scheduler to persist our, our collection in, in memory. Um, instead, this is just a plan to compute something in the future. So we're going to take our data frame. We're going to group by the uh, there's this TPEP pickup date time column. And because this is a date time column, there's this handy dandy date time accessor on it with a variety of convenient uh, fields. So we're going to get, we're going to group our data frame by day of week, and then we're going to get out the tip fraction column and compute the mean. We're not going to compute that yet. We're going to hold on to that. Call that day of week and do the same thing for an hour. So I be believe that there is just an hour Yes, there's just an hour attribute here. That's useful. And then we're going to ask the scheduler to compute that for us. And so our scheduler goes off. All of our workers are active in computing all of these little tasks for us. Uh, it's interesting to note that so there are 178 partitions in our data set, and we're doing various tasks in all those partitions in order to come up with this aggregate result. So great. Um, we can go in ahead and, and get pull down the results. Uh, because they're already in memory, this happens instantaneously. And we see that presumably this is Monday to Sunday, and we see sort of a baseline 23 to 25% tip. That's actually fairly high. New Yorkers must be pretty good tippers. Uh, but I don't see any particularly strong relationship between these numbers. They all seem more or less the same. Uh, however, if we, if we go down to the grouped by hour data set, uh, we see you know, roughly the same fraction, which makes sense. But it's surprisingly high here in the early hours of the morning which is a few percent higher, peaking here at 4 a.m., uh, in which it's you know, 34% uh, tip fraction. Uh, we can plot these results with matplotlib and use the rest of the PyData ecosystem. And we see here this sort of trough during business hours uh, with this nice little hump in the early morning. So if you're driving a cab, you may uh, not mind riding the early mornings when you get nicer tips. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about the API. The main point I wanted to get across is that it looks almost identically, to, almost identical to pandas, and gives you a nice subset of functionality to do all of your filtering, aggregation, group by reductions, etc. I want to spend a moment here and talk about performance, because uh, there's a few competitions here we've seen that really highlight some of the strengths and weaknesses of the scheduler. So when we computed the head, this so again everything we've done here has required us to interact with the cluster. So when we compute the head, we ask the cluster to go off and get for the first piece of data, compute the head and give us just those five rows back. So this 21 milliseconds is roughly the limit for a round trip time. That's roughly what's, what's binding us here. 
computing the head on a single data frame in memory is very, very cheap, far less, or it's about a millisecond. So the cost here is one of latency, one of, probably one of network latency. The length computation is also quite simple, but it actually requires us to touch every piece of data in our, in our data set. So we have to go out to every little pandas data frame scattered about our cluster and ask for the length of that data frame, and then bring all the results back and aggregate them with the sum. So this 200 milliseconds is also mostly overhead. That overhead corresponds fairly closely to the number of partitions that we have. So let's actually just uh, grab NYC dot. Right, that's more, that's more uh, legitimate. So our data set was around 23 gigabytes. Uh, and HDFS cut our data set into around 128, ma 128 megabyte chunks, which yields around 178 uh, blocks of data. So the distributed scheduler has an overhead of around one millisecond per task. So that's roughly what we're seeing here, this parity between these two numbers. So you could lower this by increasing your partition size, uh, or we can make the schedule a little bit better. Um, we can also move up here and look at this computation that we did earlier, sort of more intense computation with all of these group buys. And we see again, there's maybe a thousand, two thousand, maybe three or four thousand tasks total. And the elapsed time is around seven seconds. So maybe this is around half overhead and half actual computation. And this is great. Uh, it means that we can make these even faster as we make the scheduler faster in the future. So these numbers are uh, just only going to get better. So uh, that's it. Um, again, this 200 milliseconds is generally fine for human interaction speeds. People are pretty comfortable with that wait time. Uh, this 21 milliseconds is actually quite, uh, quite nice. Uh, that's, you know, you could do a cluster computation uh, in between every frame of a video. Uh, so this looks to a human eye quite fluid. Uh, okay, so finally, I wanna talk about what doesn't work. So DAS data frame implements only a subset of the Pandas API. There are many things in Pandas and we don't implement all of them. Uh, in particular, there's things like mutation. So you can't change data's, data in your data frame in place. Uh, also anything to do with for loops. So if you're used to using Pandas with for loops, that's not going to work. Uh, you need to use the DAS data frame API. There's also a variety of functionality like pivot tables, which uh, could absolutely work if people built it. We just don't have the manpower currently to build out all of the functionality. In addition, there's things that do work if you're using Dask data frame on a single machine. So Dask, Dask data frame uh, came out of single machine processing operating off of disk, but for which we don't have some distributed variants. In particular, Dask data frame does not have a distributed shuffle, which stops us from doing a group by apply. If you wanna apply your arbitrary Python function to each group, we can't do that. Uh, also, we can't do joins, except if you're joining on a sorted index, that'll work fine. Or if you're joining between a Dask data frame and a Pandas data frame, That'll also work fine. But just as a reminder, DAS data frame does not implement all of the Pandas API, just a well-used subset. Okay, that's all I had to say. If you want to hear more information, you can go to dask.pydata.org. Or if you're interested in the distributed memory scheduler, you can go to distributed.readthedocs.org. I'm also blogging about all of this at blaze.github.io and at my personal blog, matthewrocklin.com slash blog. Thank you for your time.